it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Hello and welcome, I'm James Max, you're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. This is Primetime, bringing you all the stories that matter. On the show tonight, can the Tories really turn it around with Labour on course for a stonking majority? Sunak banks on economic announcements this week to help turn the tide for his floundering party. Thames Water enters crunch talks amid fears of financial collapse. After a series of sewage scandals and failing to meet performance standards, we ask, can the company save itself? And the deadline looms for Trump to cough up $175 million. But will his new listed social media site give him the financial clout to survive? Plus, we'll bring you our nightly panel looking at the other stories making the headlines today with former Labour advisor Matthew Lazar and Conservative peer Lord Ed Vasey. This is Primetime. Our top story tonight, can the Tories really turn it around? They're suffering their lowest support in nearly half a century and with Labour predicted to scoop a stonky majority, whenever a general election may be, the party is seemingly at rock bottom. Rishi Sunak is banking on the economy. The minimum wage went up by just over a pound today. National insurance cuts are coming and energy prices are at their lowest for two years. Oh, it's all looking rosy, except it isn't. After months and months of difficulty, the Prime Minister says things have turned a corner. Problem is, people feel like things are getting worse, not better. Gas and electricity is still costing more than it did before the pandemic. And meanwhile, the price of everything else is just going up, not down. With just over four weeks until those local elections, is there still time? Or is it already game over? For more on this, I'm joined by uh, The Times' chief political correspondent, Aubrey Allegretti, and The Financial Times' economic commentator, Chris Giles, and pollster, John Curtis. So let's start, uh, perhaps, with um, uh, looking at some of these uh, aspects. Ultimately, despite all of these positive things which the government is touting, people feel like they are worse off than they were uh, before. So can we perhaps start with you, Aubrey? Uh, in terms of how people are feeling, are they feeling any better? Well, the polls definitely don't suggest that. I think there were many in the Conservative Party who hoped that Rishi Sunak could uh, turn things around and that his um, kind of stability that he brought when he initially came to Downing Street would lead to um, sort of better economic conditions for people. But of course, we've seen that inflation took quite a long time to come down. The Bank of England has been resistant to uh, interest rate cuts. And so that's why really Downing Street seems so determined to eat this out as long as possible and push the election into the sort of autumn slash very early winter, possibly in November next year. I think they're banking on the Bank of England uh, initiating up to three interest rate cuts uh, up to that period. So that's when they really hope that people, particularly sort of mortgage owners, will start to feel better off. Hope upon uh, hope. Giles, let me, uh, Chris, sorry, uh, let me just ask you, um, in terms of the economics of all of this, the government are obviously trying to tell us that things are getting better. They're trying to tell us that uh, the economy is putting more money in your pocket. But are they just putting some money back into pockets? Yet, uh, frankly, uh, it's no wonder people are feeling worse. They've had huge amounts of money taken out because of mortgages, because of um, fiscal lag and drag, uh, and all sorts of other aspects, which means they can't possibly feel feel any better off, can they? I think they, it depends when you take your moment of comparison from. So 
from now on, things are likely to get better, but we're starting at a very bad point where people are a lot worse off than they were at the time of the last election. So it is likely that, as Aubrey said, throughout this year, things will get a little bit better, although for lots of mortgage holders, they're still going to be paying much higher rates when they have refixes this year. They just won't be as bad as they would have been uh, a year or so ago. So there's a lot of bad news, a lot of mixed news for people. Things on average are likely to get better this year, but I think it's there's been such a difficult five years or so for household finances that it's such a long way to come back and turn it around and then win. And then, uh, John, if I may you bring you into the conversation, John Curtis, arguably the uh, the nation's favourite, the best, well-known, who only, only knows pollster that we can have. Is there any chance that the Tories can turn this around either by a general election or perhaps more pertinently for the local elections on the 2nd of May? Oh, very difficult to see how you make a significant progress by what is now local elections just no more than four weeks away. Um, and I think in part it now depends on what you mean by turnaround. Um, I think as some publicity uh, gave it last week, uh, I did remark that there is probably only a 1% chance now that the Conservatives will form the next administration, though that still encompasses the possibility we might still end up in a hung parliament uh, with a minority Labour administration, and that would certainly be a platform from which the Conservatives might potentially recover sooner rather than later. The problem they moment got the moment, of course, however, is that they're a long way from even that. They are 19 points on average behind in the polls. And as one poll emphasised at the weekend, and indeed, actually, I've now looked at the innards of that poll, and it's very, very similar to the innards of the Daily, Daily, Daily Telegraph poll a few weeks ago that caused quite a, uh, a certain amount of interest and excitement. And that is that the uh, Conservatives are losing ground particularly heavily in places where they currently hold the seat they're trying to defend, not least because of the advance of reform. So at the moment, they are do indeed face the risk not only of losing, but losing very badly de indeed, so far as seats are concerned. Now, as far as the economy is concerned, well, the problem is that Chris has put his nail, uh, uh, he's put his finger crucially on the, on, the, on the key point, and that is it's probably going to be the case that the economy is going to get more the better in the next six months. But but you've a got to persuade voters to only focus on the last six months as opposed to the last five years. And then B, and then this is the real problem, which is to try to persuade voters that you should be given the credit for that short term recovery, given that every time the economy is mentioned, basically all the opposition seemingly has to do is to mention the word to list trust. And then voters are reminded of a reason as to why perhaps the government should be regarded as being culpable for the position of the uh, economy. Now, we can debate the merits of that, but politically, that is proving toxic for the Conservatives. It's very difficult to see how they're going to be able to claim the credit for such recovery in the economy as may uh, occur, um, uh, even if that, even if the economy is somewhat better now in six, eight months' time. So, Aubrey, if I can come back to you, when we start to identify what Labour is doing, uh, admittedly, all that seemingly they have to do is just not be the Tories and it gives them an opportunity. But then when it comes down to scrutiny over policy, what are you going to be writing about? What are you going to be looking at? Because at the moment, there seems to be not a cigarette paper between all the main parties. It's just that they're not the Conservatives. Well, Labour got accused of, I suppose, not having any policies and then attracted a whole lot of criticism for junking or watering down, rather, its £28 billion green spending plan. So I think there are sort of areas of difference between the two main political parties. But seemingly what Labour has done, which is to be sort of quite uh, aloof and to be able to try not to make very many mistakes and kind of come out with some big headline grabbing policies on uh, things like the windfall tax and scrapping non-dom status. Those are the sort of consumer friendly policies that have actually been so popular that conservatives sort of stole them and, um, and sort of turned them into uh, iterations of their own. But I suspect that Keir Starmer will not want to rock the boat too much. And he's sort of straddling quite a fine line here between wanting to show uh, the public who might be nervous about voting for the Labour Party for the first time in a long time, that he is somebody who is uh, responsible, uh, stable, in contrast to the past, well, it depends how many years you want to say of the Conservatives' chaos. 
and on the one hand sort of balance that message of civility with being radical revolutionary giving people a sort of reason to turn out to vote and uh, feel particularly strongly about supporting a Labour party rather than just sort of supporting them either out of apathy or staying home and not voting conservative instead but so far he seems to be navigating that tightrope relatively well without it sort of harming his electoral prospects when it comes to trying to get into down to Chris, if I may ask you, uh, when it comes to putting more money in people's pockets, uh, this week the government will be championing and going on about their national insurance uh, changes, which perhaps are a tax change that they can or should be doing. It's just income tax, in my view, with another word or another name. But there are things that they could have done to put more money in people's pockets. If you were advising the government to put more money in people's pockets, what would you tell them to do? Well, it depends what they want to achieve. I think the public really would like to see more money go into public services at the moment because they feel that public services are really not working very well at all. Now, those can be very, very large sums to make a big difference, particularly over the short term. If you wanted to make a splash, which you know that the Labour Party wouldn't uh, follow, then you might want to choose a totemic tax, which people don't like, like inheritance tax doesn't actually cost a lot of money. Most people don't pay it even when their relatives die, but it is something that might uh, have some effect, particularly in the south of England, but then not where John was talking about, where the Conservatives are losing support in the north of England and in other more peripheral, peripheral parts of the country from London. So it's actually very difficult to, to say there is a single thing that the Conservatives could do which would shore up support in the short term. I, I'm rather with John on this, that actually it's very, very difficult to see what you can do right now, given where you are in the polls and given what's happened over the past five years. Uh, and, John, let me turn to you then and just ask you about those big issues. I'm assuming that whenever you poll, you're not only polling on uh, what people's voting intentions might be, but also what are the issues that matter to them most. Uh, in the past, perhaps it's been the economy, perhaps it's been law and order, perhaps it's even been defence or uh, Brexit or anything else. What are the top one or two issues now that everybody is saying when it comes to those polls? Well, to be honest, those are not the poll questions in which I am most interested. The poll questions in which I am most interested are the ones where people's evaluations are correlated with their willingness or otherwise to vote Conservative again. This is how you really find out what are the issues that are pushing people away from, from the Conservatives or not. The two issues that are pushing people away from the Conservatives uh, are one, the economy. People who think the economy is doing badly are much less willing to vote Conservative again than those who take a different view. And the second, as Chris has already alluded to, it's the NHS. Those who think the NHS is getting a lot worse are much less willing to vote Conservative again. Attitudes towards whether or not taxes should be going up or not are not related to why the Conservatives are down. The, the Conservatives are not being blamed for the rise in taxation. The Conservatives also, by the way, are not necessarily suffering particularly from the fact that lots of people realise that immigration has gone up. The issues that are pushing people away are one, the economy, and two, the NHS. And that's what the government needs to focus on. It's been rather misreading its electoral situation by thinking that a tax cuts and flights to Rwanda is the, is the pathway out of the difficulty in which it currently finds itself. John Curtis, pollster, thank you very much indeed for joining us. And also to Chris Giles, economics commentator at the Financial Times, and to Aubrey Allegretti, chief political correspondent at the Times. Thank you all very much indeed for joining us. Well, that's certainly uh, given us some food for thought here in the studio. Let's make uh, see what our panel make of it all. Joining me in the studio are former uh, Labour advisor Matthew Lazar and Conservative peer Lord Ed Vasey. Um, so, uh, Matthew, to you first. Look. Um, anybody who is a Labour supporter, uh, you can just rub out your hands with glee, <laughs> keep your mouth shut and just let the polls do their work, don't you? Well, I mean, they'd be tempted to do that, but I think Labour needs to make the positive case over the next six months, partly because it will become under increased scrutiny as the prospects of a Labour government uh, seem uh, ever more real. So, I mean, that's certainly what Labour strategists think, is that they will get a lot more what they call incoming uh, uh, fire and attacks uh, uh, over the next few months. So, but Are we going to see a lot of policies, though, from Labour, which, is I which are ideologically driven? Because 
Uh, on the face of it, it sounds like a good idea. Say, for example, stick VAT uh, on the private school fees, stick it to the rich, all this stuff, which is very ideologically driven. We all know that you do that. In the short term, you create a, uh, a crunch on uh, school places, you create a funding crisis within local schools. Potentially. Um, potentially. You don't get as much money as the government say that you're going to get because there's a flight. Yeah. All sorts and of that things. That is taken into the Labour's costings is a certain well, amount of people leaving, leaving the system. I mean, obviously, the private schools themselves would, you know, uh, Kelsa Prees put their hands up and well, say that loads are going to flee. Uh, uh, the, the reality is a certain percentage will, and that's been counted into. That's probably Labour's most ideological policy. You've got to give something if you're the Labour leader to the left of the party. Um, after all, he hasn't given very much uh, to, uh, to sort of left-wing opinion. Frankly, if you poll putting VAT on private schools, it's probably quite popular in the country, as are things like water renationalisation, which is too ideological and too expensive for Labour okay. to do. So you've got to have something, um, uh, some bit of red meat, uh, especially if you've been well, as firm as Keir Starmer has with the well, left. Well, frankly, the Conservatives have been trying to throw red meat around and so perhaps they should learn their lesson because it hasn't been very effective, has it, Ed? I mean, you, you have a look at what Rishi Sunak and his leadership have done. Uh, they've undertaken the wrong tax moves in their budget. They haven't dealt with core Tory issues like law and order and defence. Uh, they still haven't worked out that they've got to make the economy grow. They haven't stopped the boats. Um, it's a disaster. Well, I was fascinated to hear what John Curtis said at the end of your uh, long interview with those uh, three great pundits, in the sense he was basically saying the electorate are deserting the Tories because of the economy and health. Now, I can't disagree with John Curtis because he crunches the numbers, but I'm thinking back to kind of 1997, when the Tories lost by a landslide at a time when the economy was booming. Ken Clark, who was then the Chancellor, had kind of fixed the economy, he if had. I can put it that way. It was, and arguably, to a certain extent, the Labour government benefited from this great economy that they inherited. So it does strike me that the electorate has turned away from the Conservatives because they're not sure what they stand for. They have these kind of whack-a-mole policies that come from nowhere. They make an issue salient like the boats, which... You know, is a, is an important issue, but would not necessarily have registered so highly with the public. It is, but they're and failed. they're failing on it. So these are the problems the Tories face, and, and of course they've been having a civil war since Brexit, which was meant to solve the Tory civil war. So these are all the problems they face. It's not looking great. Uh, having, but going back to what John Curtis says, you know, it is clearly part of Rishi Sunak's strategy to have an election in November at a time when he hopes inflation will have fallen, we've had up to three okay. interest rate cuts. And at that point, you think maybe people will be feeling better off. Well, they might do. But, Matthew, when it comes to the NHS, mm. um, we know that it's been deified in the eyes of the public. The pandemic probably reinforced that even further mm -hmm. if, if we didn't have it already, that it's a national religion and you can't speak out against it. But every party knows that there are many aspects which are broken, that the original idea, deal, great as it was 70 years ago, is no longer fit for purpose. When is or who is going to be bold enough to stop just pumping more money into it and realise that reform is what is required? Presumably, Labour, if they don't get quite quick results on the NHS, they could very, find them, very well find themselves very popular initially, a year later, not so much. Well, I think that is a danger for the Labour government generally, as Ed was saying, it's inheriting a much worse economic situation than in 97. So a mixture of, you know, the economy plus the NHS crisis could see uh, a Labour government becoming unpopular, and especially we may have foreign affairs in that equation. But in terms of deifying the NHS, well, West Streeting, Labour's uh, Shadow Health Secretary, has been absolutely clear that the NHS needs to be a shrine, uh, not a shrine, but a service. And so I think the person who can really reform it is Labour, which actually Labour and government did do quite a lot of reform in the NHS. Um, uh, in some ways, it's got the political capital that enables it to do that because of the trust that the public have uh, uh, and have innately have with well, Labour I think, and the NHS. Well, I think they do. But from the two of you for now... Well, uh, I want to you. say something in return... Well, I'm sure you do. ...to what Matthew said, because I want to agree with him. Because okay, I think Wes Streeting is one of the most interesting yeah. front Well, I'm sure you do, and I'd and love to hear more... pulled it out I'd, about the NHS. I'd like to hear right. more from you in a moment. However, next on Primetime, urgent talks at Thames Water. As the company's future and that of its customers hangs in the balance. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, oi, treat girl.
when JK Rowling says, let's just be honest. That's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching Primetime with me, James Max. Next tonight, the clock is ticking to come up with a plan to salvage Thames Water. It's understood urgent restructuring talks will take place in the next few days as shareholders refuse to put any more money in to prop up the company. It's struggling with around £18 million of debt and wants to put up uh, customer bills by 56% to pay it off. The water regulator is currently weighing that decision with an expected outcome in June. Now, for more of this, I'm joined by David Oslin from Labour Hub. Now, I'm assuming it's more than £18 million that we're trying to deal with here. I think it's many billions uh, but, uh, that we're trying to deal with in terms of what, um, what is, uh, I suppose, required of uh, the water company. Now... Um, David, perhaps you can just explain in terms of the latest options and also perhaps uh, what is being considered politically. Well, um, I actually wouldn't make an ideological issue of this. All water companies have to do is pump water to people's taps as cheaply as possible and not dump untreated sewage in vast quantities into rivers. But Thames Water's management can't seem to manage even that. Um, I'd suggest social ownership, then, is a simple common-sense solution here. More than two-thirds of Tory voters actually back that idea, and even the Financial Times describes it as the only realistic option, at least temporarily. OK, so we, we, understand, we, we understand the social ownership option, but that's not necessarily going to solve the problems, because regardless of who owns Thames Water, an enormous amount of money has got to be found. Now, where's it going to be found from? Is it going to be found from investors? Is it going to be found from the taxpayers? Where, where would you say, social ownership or not, where's the billions of pounds that have got to be used to bail out Thames Water going to come from? Well... Public ownership would mean big savings, firstly, on things like dividends and on debt servicing. Um, that money's secondly, gone. Secondly, of course, governments, governments can always 
borrow more cheaply than private companies can. The necessary infrastructural investment could be securitised, a bond could be issued to cover it, paid by the revenues from future bills. So, you know, while water companies should be about civil engineering and not about financial engineering. There are there are ways around this problem. Well, you say there are ways around it, but what you've identified is exactly the problem that exists for Thames Water, that you've got investors who don't want to put any more money in. Fair enough. I understand. Uh, we can go along the ideological route, and again, I totally understand why or how a, a natural monopoly was put into uh, private ownership is beyond uh, many people. I get all of that. The problem that we've got is we've got a company that owes £18 billion pounds. Uh, needs many, many billions of pounds in order to sort itself out, to stop, as you correctly say, putting sewerage into rivers and uh, providing the water service that we need. But nobody's got an answer as to where we get the money from. Well, as I say, um, I think I've given you an answer on where we can get the money to fund infrastructure work. As for the fate of the company, well, let it go bust. As far as most of us will be concerned, the Chinese and Abu Dhabi sovereign wealth funds can take the hit. The pension funds will have diversified portfolios and won't go under because of this. If shareholders have made a bad investment call, then it's right that shareholders should end up out of pocket, isn't it? Well, I, th I think we might, we might agree on that. David Osland uh, from Labour Hub, thank you very much indeed for joining us here on Talk. It's much appreciated. So, uh, Matthew, look, when it comes to this, this is going to be the nettle that everybody has to face. Everybody can look back with a, a nice rear-view mirror, which is uh, Keir Starmer's particular expertise. And it's, say, it's people in opposition's expertise. And, and, <laughs> and, and what, a, what a terrible thing it was to privatise Thames Water. And I think... Not only was it a failure, because when you privatise something that there's a, a possibility of competition, it can work. British Telecom, uh, you can argue British Gas, all these yeah. other things, BP, all these things. They've worked Something like competition. Well. But, but when you have something which is a natural monopoly and, frankly, should be a, a basic provision, there's an issue here. That company has been drained of funds yeah. for years. But when it comes to finding the money, OK, investors can take a hit. But Thames Water and all the other water companies are not going to be successful unless they have billions of pounds put into them. Where's that money going and to come course, from? The, if, they're, if they're back on the, uh, uh, on the government books, then so is their debt. Uh, do, you, um, do you remember the lengths that Gordon Brown went to to keep the debt of network rail off the government borrowing requirement, the public sector borrowing requirement? I mean, I think that, um, a, that in terms of, uh, pr uh, of nationalising, the only thing that Labour would do now, because Labour's dropped its pledge to nationalise them, which was a Corbyn pledge which Keir kept, partly to get him through the leadership election, uh, which has, you know, cynics would say, uh, has quietly been dropped. Uh, but I think if you, if, if, if you are going to see them actually go bankrupt, you're going to see a network rail style uh, nationalisation where you basically get them for nothing but the debt will be the issue. Uh, Ed, have aspects of privatisation failed? No, I don't think they have. I think that uh, people have got really carried away with this uh, whole issue. I mean, uh, Thames Water was privatised 35 years ago. If you took a water bill from 35 years ago and uprated it with inflation, it would be much higher now than it is under Thames Water. Privatised companies have saved consumers a great deal of money. Thames Water's just built the sewage equivalent of the M25 in London, the so-called super sewer. It's taken decades to build. It's got an enormous in Victorian infrastructure that it's inherited yeah, that's that, was, that's that, that was under-invested in for years and years when it was a nationalised company. This is finest Thames Water. You wouldn't be drinking this in a Spanish television studio. I can tell you, we forget how lucky we are in this country that we can drink well, thankfully, from this, the tap. This comes out of a machine which has got a filter. Yeah, in it, so. I did like so to I'm say it. And, uh, <laughs> for the purposes of my rhetoric, this is Thems okay. Water. As we well, call it in the, the North, Corporation for the, Pop. Anyway, for the, for so the purposes, all for the purposes, of that is all however, very good stuff. Yeah, now. yeah, look. That's all very well. You've just given a whole load of bluster because the, the reality I've is... I've given you the facts. No, the reality is... I've told you is, about a super sewer. Yeah, great. I've told you about the prices. I understand. Not a single reservoir. The, the issue that we've got, That's though, because is the that, local MP opposed it. Yeah, but the issue that we've Wasn't got is that regulation and the regulatory environment has failed. That when it comes yes. to how we, the consumer, we, yeah. the taxpayer, have been looked after. I'm sorry, but when it comes to Ofwat or indeed any of the other organisations, they're a complete and utter shambles. Look, Matthew just made a very good point. As a local MP, it was incumbent on, upon me to oppose the reservoir that was planned for my constituency, which is much needed. But it wasn't Thames Water's fault. It's the terrible planning system we have in this country. That's why they can't get a reservoir. Well, we're built. told that we're, and you're that right, we're not going to be able to force them through. And the, 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 the Cameron policy was to, the, the, you know, to force through matters of can national you stop infrastructure. stop disappearing down the plug hole? 
I'm just saying the planning system is a disaster. And, and you're right, the regulator. For the, last the regulator. Years. Years. It's not a the flag regulator. Flag. It's a fact. Oh, look, come off it. The I know you made your could pitch. Have, I know you want to leave the Tory party. Make your the pitch. The regulator should have forced Thames right. Water to invest yes. more okay. and pay lower dividends to shareholders. But Fact. that is not what is wrong with privatisation. OK, so privatisation couldn't, could have worked. But here's the issue. All the things that the Tories are supposed to have delivered on, whether it's privatised industries, and, and I agree with you, the efficiency of having a private company deliver should have been better for us, the taxpayer. But because they took their eye off the ball, because they didn't make the regulation, later work it has or is failing and it's the same with all the other things that the Tories should or could have been in charge of lower taxation building an economy looking after our nation making sure that we got a proper defense service la 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 the whole lot you fail because you've been so busy in fighting you've forgotten what I you're here to what's do got your goat uh, James, you know, you just, Poor government. You just we're talking exactly. about Thames Water and we've ended up with, you know, lower taxes and defence. First of all, we've got two brand new aircraft carriers, the best aircraft carriers Hang in the world. We, we, can't we, work. Let, we, we, we haven't got enough, we haven't got enough Don't be rude them. about our naval, our navy. I would never be rude don't about be our navy. Don't be rude about the navy. I'd be rude Matthew, about the defence secretary that have let them down. Secondly, we're always banging on about lowering taxes, which I personally don't agree with. And I can't remember the third thing that you started getting. Law and order. Law and order. No, there was something else that I was going to get you. There are so many things where they failed. Uh, anyway, failure. the defence of Ukraine. Oh, well, well done on that. That's Thank worked, you. hasn't it? Anyway, uh, well, we're going to move on. on. We're going to move on. I think you're stuck in a rut, James. You need to get your... I, I think James get... reflects the views of the voters. James reflects the reflective views of the voters combined with a dose of common sense, which seems to be lacking from our political for classes. Office? No. Well, I'm standing for prime time. Should. Next, we're going to be looking at Donald Trump's social media network and soars to $8 billion in value after going public. But is all as it seems. We'll have the very latest from New York next. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't oh. going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. 
Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Well, next tonight, the clock is ticking for Donald Trump to pay up $175 million in a bond if he's to hold off paying the full $454 million civil fraud judgment for grossly inflating his net worth. Surely the amount of money that you got stuck behind the back of the sofa. But on the face of it, Trump seems to have found the answer. After listing Truth Social almost a week ago, uh, which going into Easter weekend had a market value of, wait for it, 8 billion dollars. Trump owner owns almost 80% of the shares, 80 million shares rather, valued at around five billion dollars uh, as of Friday. Surely more than enough to get him out of financial uh, predicaments. Well, considering the site lost a total of more than 40 million dollars last year, it appears as if valuation is um, absolutely hogwash. But is Trump really in the clear or is the bubble stock about to burst. For more information on this, I'm joined by, down the line by Fox News commentator Joe Concha. So, Joe, thank you very much indeed for joining us here on Talk. It's much appreciated. So, we all know that any social media company, when it comes to valuation, the investment bank has sticked multiple values on uh, negative amounts of money. I don't think Uber's ever uh, or made much of a profit in its life. Uh, Twitter slash X never really did, and all the others took years to actually throw some money. So, true social, mm -hmm. can we believe the hype? Can we, is it true? Well, it depends on how you look at the numbers, and it gets utterly confusing for your average layman out there when you hear, okay, shares of Donald Trump's social media company, they're down almost 25% today. And markets close here in the States in about 90 minutes. So it looks like it's going to stay around that number. I mean, that's a huge drop. And the reason why the stock has dropped so precipitously is because the company published its full year earnings results last year, and it showed, as you mentioned, they had $4 million in sales, but this is the key part, nearly $60 million in operating losses. So the stock just five days ago was trading at $66 a share. It's about $48 per share now. And remember, just last week, as you just rightly pointed out, that Trump's net worth jumped to over $8 billion after the stock went public, which defied logic because how can a losing entity be worth so much? So the, the simple truth, and you're exactly right, as we've seen time and again, it will take a long time for this company to turn a profit, if at all. I mean, Donald Trump, for example, his account, he has about 7 million followers on True Social. When he was on Twitter, uh, X, 90 million followers followers. And True Social is basically an echo chamber where so many people are agreeing with each other. It's not terribly interesting. So I, I'm just not sure that that $8 billion number is, is so real. It's on paper, but is it tangible? That's the part that is confusing. So we've seen tech companies particularly vaporize in value as and when people start to dig through the numbers. And we also know that sometimes people just want to buy in, they want a piece of it, uh, partly because they like the people or the hype or whatever it is. We've seen it with WeWork, uh, we saw it before with Uber and X and various others that really took a long time to come through. And over, over the years we've seen a number of uh, dot-com failures. Uh, it's hardly new news. At what stage does uh, Truth Social get vaporized by um, investors? I believe it all depends on the presidential election, quite frankly. If Donald Trump is reelected, I mean, think about what a comeback story this is when you consider all the slings and arrows that have been thrown at him for the past, let's face it, nine years since he announced uh, he was running for president in 2015. So if he actually were president again, then suddenly I would imagine True Social becomes the main platform for the sitting commander in chief of our armed forces and president of the United States, leader of the free world, whatever label you want to apply. And then from there, perhaps uh, shares will take off because more people have an interest in terms of what Trump is saying as president as opposed to a candidate. But otherwise, I don't know how you sustain 60 million losses on a yearly basis and investors eventually just say, all right, enough, we're out of here. So I'm assuming, as you correctly say, and it's the same with any uh, tech firm particularly, they look into the future. They're not looking at the costs uh, on an annualised basis. They're certainly not looking at the right. revenues. And what they're basically saying is, if Donald Trump becomes president, this thing completely changes, and that's why we're paying the money. So just to keep a few uh, thousand dollars, if you like, in is probably worth it. Is it also because we're seeing significant support from Trump supporters who are just piling in? They like anything he does. 
Well, precisely. And that's why, again, I, I mentioned all the things that you mentioned the trials before as far as 91 felony accounts uh, against the former president. And yet his numbers have been very stable in terms of beating Joe Biden in every crucial swing state in the United States. That's North Carolina, Georgia, Arizona, Nevada, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania and Michigan. And on a national level, in terms of polls, he's leading there as well. If you look back at 2020, Trump didn't lead in any polls leading up to Election Day, and he was beaten. Even 2016, Hillary Clinton was leading in every poll, and he somehow won that. Now he's actually leading. So the odds-on favorite right now is Trump, if you look at the betting markets, that he should win again. So, yeah, would you should you take a flyer on $48 a share for the True Social and, and Trump media uh, if you think Trump's going to win? Sure, because right now you can get it at a pretty decent price, considering, again, 25 percent just got shaved off in one day. Because I'm fascinated about the popularity of Donald Trump. I mean, uh, of course, his core supporters, you know, very popular. He won that uh, Republican nomination almost with ease. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the nation, I'm assuming it's still as polarised as ever it was before. Uh, yes and no. In terms of 2020, Joe Biden was able to win the presidency by basically staying in his basement and saying, look at that guy over there. You know, I'm normal. He's crazy. He's ruined the country. I'm here to fix it. And now Joe Biden has a record that he has to run on and on issues like people. His core supporters like Trump, the person in terms of his authenticity, in terms of his the fact that he's not a your typical fake, phony, uh, authentically challenged politician. He's he's he seems like a normal guy, even though he's a billionaire, but yet he relates better to blue collar workers than Joe Biden can. But now Biden has to defend his record on inflation, on crime, on immigration and the border and foreign policy and education. And I could go down the line where Joe Biden is really struggling at this point. So Trump's popularity only goes up now because on the issues, he seems to be on the right side of those major issues that matter to people most, economy, crime, immigration. Well, I think we're all fascinated about how uh, Joe Biden will get to the end of a sentence, let alone a, a political campaign to try and win back the White House. But then, you know, that's another matter for another day. Joe Concha, Fox News contributor, thank you very much indeed for joining us here on Primetime on Talk. Thank now, you, next, I'm going to be joined by the Primetime panel. Where were we going? Well, hammer and tongs, I guess, over the top stories of the day, including J.K. Rowling daring police to arrest her. Find out what that's about next. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family 
And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Time now for our primetime panel to dissect some of the other big stories of the day. Still with me, former Labour advisor Matthew Laza and Conservative peer Lord Ed Vasey. Now, let's start with the J.K. Rowling story. Uh, the author has dared to police uh, to arrest her as she lashed out at Scotland's new hate crime laws. The new measures came into force today and aim to tackle harm caused by hatred. This is on the grounds of age, disability, race, religion, sexual orientation and transgender identity. Now, supporters of the new laws insist that they will make Scotland more tolerant, but critics such as the Harry Potter author say the legislation could stifle free speech and fails to extend these protections to women. Um, look, this is a particularly thorny subject. Ed, perhaps I could start with you and, and your views on this. Um, some people try and have a conversation about this particular matter by saying, oh, how do you define a woman? Um, and uh, J.K. Rowling has been particularly vehement against, um, I don't know, some of the changes in dealing with transgender issues. Where do you stand on these uh, political hot <coughs> potatoes? I stand with uh, J.K. Rowling on this. I think she's quite right to um, point out the flaws in some of this uh, debate. And I think that the intolerance that has been generated by... Uh, as it were, some aspects of the trans lobby is um, outrageous. I mean, obviously, one supports trans people, one supports people transitioning, but there are certain red lines which I've always felt strike me as complete common sense. One is sport, uh, where if you've been through puberty as a man and then you transition to being a woman, you are competing unfairly against women. That goes without saying. Uh, I think self-declaration allowing you into women's spaces is outrageous, so the opportunity for somebody who is still uh, genetic, uh, still a man in terms of, you know, uh, their physical makeup, even if they self-identify as a woman, should not be in a women's prison. And thirdly, I think the eradication of women uh, from language, you know, so talking about people who become pregnant rather than women, is really outrageous. And women have fought for their rights. I mean, I know you haven't had a single woman on your show tonight, James, but generally speaking, they are very well represented. Um, and they fought for their rights. And to have this kind of counter-narrative is really outrageous. Uh, Matthew, um, this is a political hot potato, and in particular for the Labour Party, it's, it's tricky because the SNP, uh, you know, and, and, you know, having pushed through uh, various aspects of this, and Scottish Labour having pushed through various aspects of this, you know, this is something they support. Um, if... Well, the Scottish Labour only supported it when it uh, pushed for a lot of changes to it. So there are some sensible changes that have been done. I personally, if I had been an MSP, I wouldn't have voted for it because I think there were huge flaws in the, in the in this bill. So do you support J.K. Rowling in what she's suggesting then? Well, I think I, mean, I, I think J.K. Rowling needs to be uh, listened to, and I think that uh, I think she's being a bit provocative today. I You're hope she doesn't like get, a politician. She doesn't do you get support arrested. her or not, Matthew? Well, I mean, J.K. Rowling was one of the Labour. J.K. Party's Rowling last... should be listened to. What is that? She was one of the Labour Party's biggest donors. So um, to, 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 you know, for, to, well, to... she won't be now. And I think that we, you know, I, I think you, I would like a situation where uh, people on the left can have a conversation with J.K. Rowling, but then rather than pushing. But you ask Keir Starmer, but you ask Keir Starmer, and, and you ask. He's him, very clear what a woman is. Okay, so what is a woman? It's it's a biological female. Okay, because that's not quite what he says. Because it is what he says okay, now. Okay, how look, do he you, got embarrassed you, about it. The best person. No, 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 but how do you deal with the issues? So, say for example, somebody has decided to tra transition. Yeah. And I totally agree with Ed when he says, "Look, you've got people who go through puberty, Absolutely. and frankly, it becomes extremely difficult when it comes to sport. I'm yeah. afraid you do have to." And have Keir's been very clear rules. that it's it up to individual sports. Okay. And would err on the but side. Say, say for example, somebody has decided decide. to transition. Yeah. What loo are they allowed to use? If they have, if they have formally transitioned under the law. 
OK, then they should use uh, the, 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 the loo that is their agenda, the agenda that has been assigned to them by the law. OK, but if you just decide that you're going to call yourself a woman today, um, then you should use the agenda for your the biological sex that you were but born. But isn't that part of the problem which the trans lobby, and I'm not sure I necessarily agree with every aspect of things that they answer, uh, ask for, but what they would say is that the day that you decide that you are going to transition is that the day the discrimination starts. And, if and you they're are right not, to a certain extent. And if you are not able to have a transitionary way, and I think there are ways and means to deal with it, but I think that we politically have become so bound up with talking about biological females and males, um, not recognising the fact that some people do need to transition. It must be the hardest uh, decision. Absolutely. I don't, I, mean, I, said, I don't yeah. get it. And I think, I think, I think Labour's position is sensible, which is against self-identification in terms of uh, what, the, what the SNP wanted to do before they were stopped by Westminster. Do you think, uh, do you but, think but, though, Ed, do you think we've over-politicised this? It means that we can't have a sensible debate. Yes, I mean, I, and when you were talking, I mean, it just sounds a really weird thing to say, but when you're talking about lose, that kind of sums up the nuance and the grey area. So for me, look, if I'm a man and I want to transition to be a woman, that is a very difficult process, mm. but it shouldn't allow me, I think, to go into a women's changing room. Because when the, the women in that changing room... When should it this allow is, you? Uh, exactly, and there's a very nuanced debate, and we should have a debate about that. And I'm perfectly willing to hear somebody from the trans lobby saying, hey, no, no, you should be able to go in the women's changing room. I really don't think I'd change my mind. Lose, weirdly, are sort of more of a grey area because you can, in theory, shut the cubicle. I mean, yeah, to, be fair, to, to be fair, fair if, if, somebody, if somebody is um, transitioning and they've kind of got their got their art sorted pretty well, you're not actually going to know. So, exactly. But I do think that this is the area where we be, have to be things, able to yeah. have a sensible exactly. conversation. Yes, because it's more things like rape crisis centres which have exactly. particularly upset And JK nobody Rowling. should be able to cause uh, and, and commit a sexual crime against any other human being. Absolutely. And that's and what we need to go against. And it has to come So normal, you know, women who have concerns about this are kind of drowned out and demonised for just saying, look, I'm going in my change room, I don't want to change next to a man, tricky, even though that man might identify as a woman. Tricky subject. However, I'm sure there's more to discuss, but perhaps we can have more sensible conversations. However, let's talk about the government. Oh, what a, what a surprise. They're facing a rebellion from their own backbenchers over plans to criminalise homelessness. Uh, rebels claim that as many 40 Conservatives from both the left and the right of the party are unwilling to support the government's criminal justice bill, as is. A group of 40 would easily be able to overturn the government majority of 53, if backed fully by opposition MPs too. Um, Matthew, I'll start with you on this one. I find it absolutely astonishing that the government is looking at uh, the symptom and not the cause. Absolutely. Um, homelessness is a particular problem. I don't want to see people sleeping rough in no. the streets. I don't want to see people begging. I don't want to see uh, people causing a fray or, or, totally. or, you know, and we've got, clearly, you go into the West End of London or any major city, there are people sleeping rough yep. left, right and centre. Some of it is because some people do sleep rough, you know, no matter how Which is a amazing, small bit, a bit small hardcore. Bit of it. But some of it, they must be telling us that something's gone wrong here. Absolutely. Well, if you remember during the pandemic, one of the, uh, the positives of the pandemic was we solved the homeless problem overnight because everybody was given shelter and there literally wasn't anybody sleeping on the streets. With the sticking plaster so yeah. that we then took away. Which we took away. Well, we should have put into, in place a long-term solution. And instead, uh, criminalising people, it's just going to... It's the law of unintended consequences. What's it going to do? The police say they can't attend mental health crises. How are the police going to... If you criminalise it, it's just not going to be enforced. It's, it's just... It's, 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 it's just I, trying to... I don't people want to trying appear. to position themselves for Tory leadership. I action. don't appear, want to appear as if I'm just bashing anything thing or everything the government does, but I do That's genuinely... That's how you appear, It me. is, because I genuinely despair that... No, Try and defend this, Ed. No common sense has been applied to this. That exactly. if somebody is sleeping rough on the streets, there are plenty of reasons, and sometimes it is down to that individual and, and them having taken wrong choices. But in order to get them off the streets, legislation and criminalising is not the way to yeah. do it. Is it? Or you tell me. Would you rebel if you were in the Commons still? Well, I haven't looked in detail at the legislation, Matthew, but um, so I'm not going to answer the question, having berated you earlier for not answering uh, the question. But I do agree, you know, that uh, often homelessness is a symptom, not a cause, that people who are homeless have many deep-seated problems. It is not simply often, weirdly, in the case of homeless people, often if you just gave them a, a front door key and here's a home, it wouldn't actually work because they've got big, big... They've got major and problems, problems and issues. And, and mental health you tackle those. ..problems. problems. Um, <clears throat> I, I mean, I understand that something behind this legislation is, to a certain extent, an updating of the Vagrancy Act, which is a 19th century law. So it might well be that the government has a justification to look at this again. Mm. It may be that they've got it wrong in terms of how they've interpreted the best way to upgrade 
uh, update the vagrancy law okay. so the police can use it effectively. Let's, let's move on because time is against us, but uh, you'd be disappointed if I didn't talk about the day, uh, deputy Labour leader, Angela Rayner. She's under growing pressure to release tax advice and other documents relating to the sale of a former council home, as some in her own party are said to be growing restless over the issue. Senior Tories have been calling for more transparency on her property dealings, which may have seen her dodge capital gains tax, wrongly came a council tax discount and possibly breach election law. And I think Look, on one hand, I see this as a political vendetta and is it really necessary? And on the other hand, though, if you are vying to be Deputy Prime Minister, frankly, you should be able to stick to the rules of the law. Why has she not nuked this? Well, I think she, I think she has nuked it in the sense that people like Sue Gray, who's uh, a case chief oh, of staff... Oh, as if you trust her. Well, uh, well uh, she was oh, the... Oh, steady on, James. Yes. She's a very reputable civil yeah. servant. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, I, I, I think what's happened is, is this has been checked out. I think if, if she'd been found to that she, she did owe any money, she would have been out with a grovelling apology mm. and a chequebook several days ago. Once okay. the police and the council looking properly, she'll be found to have done nothing wrong. You reckon? Uh, what would she do? Well, you, disclosure? You, uh, you nailed it with both points one it it does feel like a political vendetta but i and i slightly felt you know call the dogs off angerina but at the same time i also do accept if you're going to be the de potentially the deputy prime minister in six months time i'm afraid this is the new normal for prominent yeah, labor politicians it, they will get the scrutiny just as people like nadim zahawi got the scrutiny and, or whatever and everyone well, just everyone should know everyone should receive the scrutiny however yeah. all i can leave you with is news that nasa are planning to grow plants on the moon which could save us all and i'm sure tell that me that more can us, well sadly i can't <laughs> uh, but that can unite us all because we've been disagreeing on pretty much everything so, for now, uh, Matthew and Ed, thank, thank you very you. much indeed uh, for joining uh, me here on Primetime. Now, JJ, he's up next. What's on the show tonight? Well, James, we have got the legend, Miss Sharon Osborne, live on this show. We'll be talking all things America with her, Trump, Prince Harry, Meghan Markle. Also going to talk about this all-women's football competition down in Australia where they had five non-women also playing, who obviously then went on to win it. We'll discuss that. The Met Police, James. A swastika, apparently it's not racist. Are they idiots? Yes, I think they very much are idiots. We're talking about that as well. And the gift that keeps on giving, Prince Andrew. Yeah, I don't know why this guy keeps popping up, especially over Easter weekend, but more of that later. Sounds like an absolutely packed show, and indeed the national treasure that is heard. Sharon Osborne, fantastic. That's JJ up next. Now, that's all I've got time for tonight. I'm going to be back tomorrow for prime time. Thanks for watching. You can also catch me for early breakfast at five. Good night. Republic of Mike Graham. <laughs> Weeknights at 8 on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position. But I think he'd need to say that he got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning 
he'd been singled out. Now you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop 